Welcome, First United Methodist Church Plano. I'm Matt Gaston, the lead pastor, and we are thrilled to have you worshiping with us on this first Sunday of August. Uh, we hope that you'll register your attendance on our website. You'll see a place to push that registration number that we might connect with you, as well as the Give button that allows you on a recurring basis to support the ministries which you're enjoying right now. A couple of things in the life of the church before we continue this communion service. Um, and that is we've got uh, some ramping up for our August 15th new thing. We've got some usher training that's happening just before uh, the 11 o'clock hour. We'll meet at 10.15 today and next Sunday, invite you to be part of that. And then on August 15th, we will have a whole evening of great activity for children, youth, and adults. Uh, studies and for the kids, playtime, inflatables inside and out, might even be getting a little bit wet. Some special music during a common dinner time from five to six. Rear of the Steer Barbecue will be served. We simply need you to register on our website your desire to be here individually or as a family. This is going to be a real opportunity for us to come back together around table, just as we're coming around table today. This is Communion Sunday, so I hope that you'll have ready some bread, some grape juice, that in a little bit we will share Christ's body, Christ's blood together. One last item, and it's an important one. I uh, want you to know that we have heard the anxiety that is out there over the announcement of um, changed worship services on August 15th. We also hear the anxiety that is out there around the changes around a possible land sale. And then of course, for all of us, there's COVID. We wanna make sure that we as a family of faith remain a family of faith, trusting in God in every step that we take. And the last thing we would wanna do is to create one more reason for anxiety in any of our lives as together we face that which so often we don't seem to have control over. So we are pivoting as a church. And on August 15th, we will indeed have a new thing. And we will indeed have two hours of worship. The first will be nine o'clock. This will be a blended service. Elements of traditional, elements of contemporary, mostly youth oriented. And then at the 11 o'clock service, we will have restored a traditional worship service at the 11 o'clock worship service here in the sanctuary. We'll also be starting concurrently our contemporary service in our renovated chapel designed exactly for that purpose. So that when you come, you have choices at our 11 o'clock hour, traditional or contemporary, with everyone being able to take advantage of the 10 o'clock discipleship hour for children, youth, and adults. We hear the pain out there. We hear the anxiety. We want to be responsive in helping us as a church tie together, cling together, stand on the rock together, and face that uncertainty out there together. Thank you for your faith. Most welcome to this communion service. We're really glad you're here.
could I do? They offer this heart, oh God, completely to you. Sing that again. So what could I say? And what could I do? Friends, it seems like just two weeks ago we began our series, The Ties That Bind, but it's been five weeks since we began this series. Today is our last installment, and in these six weeks, we have followed the narrative of David from the time that he slayed Goliath to the time now where he has to really reflect inwardly, what does it mean to be a faithful child of God? What does that entail? And between those two points, we have really kind of sort of held the Bible up as a mirror for ourselves as we've tracked David's progress and setbacks. We've grieved as David grieved. We've begun again as David began again. We've trusted God as David trusted God. We've been about building as David was about building. And then last week, the first of what I said was a series within the series, David sins as we sin. And I said that was the first of a two-part series within the series because you can't have sin in the eyes of God without there being grace sufficient for us to be restored. And that's what today ends our series talking about is, is restoration. So I invite us to listen for this still uncomfortable Word of God as the Bible is always honest about our humanity. Picking up in our storyline in chapter 11 of 2 Samuel, I invite us to listen for the Word of God beginning in verse 26. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband Uriah was dead, she mourned for her husband. After the time of mourning was over, David sent for her and brought her back to his house. She became his wife and bore him a son. But what David had done was evil in the Lord's eyes. So the Lord sent Nathan to David. Nathan was a prophet. When Nathan arrived, he said, there were two men in the same city, one rich, one poor. The rich man had a lot of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing, just one small ewe lamb that he'd bought. He raised that lamb, and it grew up with him and his children. It would eat from his food and drink from his cup, even sleep in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now, a traveler came to visit the rich man, but he wasn't willing to take anything from his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who'd arrive. Instead, he took the poor man's ewe lamb and prepared it for the visitor. David got very angry. And he said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the one who did this is demonic. Other translations say, should be dead. He must restore the ewe lamb seven times over because he did this and because he had no compassion. You are the man, Nathan said to David. As surely as the Lord lives, the one who did this is you. 
This is what the Lord God of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel and delivered you from Saul's power. I gave you a master's house to you and gave you his wives into your embrace. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. If that was too little, I would have given even more. Why have you despised the Lord's word? By doing what is evil in his eyes, you've struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, taken his wife as your own. You used the Ammonites to kill him. Because of that, you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite as your own. And because you've done this, the sword will never leave your own house. This is what the Lord says. I am making trouble come against you from inside your own family. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives away, give them to your friend. He will have sex with your wives in broad daylight. You did what you did secretly, but I will do what I'm going to do before all of Israel in the light of day. I've sinned against the Lord, David said. The Lord has removed your sin, Nathan replied to David. You won't die. This is the still uncomfortable word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, you do not pull punches when you tell us who we are. But you also do not pull punches in reminding us of whose we are. And therein we will find our redemption, our restoration. Thanks be to God. Amen. It was a horrendous story that you very likely read, saw, heard about in just the last week or so. The case was cracked some time ago, but the story behind the cracking of the case only came out last week. You'll recall that three years ago, uh, 2018, there was a string of discovered murders of elderly women in their homes and in retired residential communities, 17 of them to be exact. Police officers, law enforcement from both counties were searching frantically to try to find out who or how many were part of these mysterious but serial deaths. They finally identified, through great scrutiny, a gentleman named Billy Chimmermer, 47-year-old man who found it was easy to slip into people's homes, elderly persons' homes, and some residential centers, only to walk into their open rooms, close the door, put a pillow over their face, suffocate them, and then take whatever jewelry and cash was in their room and walk out. Seventeen times Billy Chimmerer did this. One of those who Billy thought he had killed was Mary Bartell. But in fact, he did not. And Mary awakened when others came in, revived her, took her to the hospital, and over the course of the following months was able to help police identify the person by description and in a series of other clues from other sources finally found and arrested Billy Chimmerer. Her name remained anonymous, of course, but once he was indicted and once he was taken to court for trial, Mary's name came out. And in just the last few months, was honored by the Dallas Police Department for her heroism as a citizen in helping them crack just a terrifying case. Mary, who was a, is a loyal Catholic, would get up every morning and go to prayers, go to mass before going and partaking with friends in their aerobics class. She would, because of the trauma and some damage, she would finally die at the ripe old age of 93 in 2020. But as shocking as that story was for all of us to read about and follow, what was more shocking, even to her family, was that in the last months of her life, she communicated and made it clear to Billy Chimmerer that she forgave him and that she would be praying for him daily, which she did to the last day of her life. Rick, her son who helped write the book, 
said her generosity was just sort of her spirit, her way of being. But her verbalizing her forgiveness of a killer surprised even us. But he said that was her way. She understood that to not forgive another was like swallowing poison and expecting the other person to die. It simply wasn't her way. That is the kind of radical forgiveness. That is the kind of shocking news that David receives in his conversation with Nathan. You remember from last week, we said this is PG material. You remember last week that David commits adultery, he commits murder, and he commits a cover-up because he is the king of all of Israel. He can't afford for his reputation to be tarnished. But when the news comes to him that not only is Bathsheba pregnant and not only is Uriah now killed, he has to make it look like this child is his. So he takes Bathsheba just as he did the first time and takes her as his wife. So that when that child would be born some eight months later, everybody would accept that this is his. But as we also said last week about our sin, about our missing the mark, God is not fooled. God knows our every weakness. And so God sends Nathan, the prophet, who confronts David not straight on, but with a story, with a parable, which David listens to and becomes affected by because in that story is such a gross miscarry of justice. In that story is such a gross negligence of all persons who are the weakest, who are on the margins. A rich man takes the one pet animal of a poor family for his own and offers it as food, sacrifice for a guest. And David understands clearly from his upbringing in the Torah, in his upbringing in the temple, that this simply is not allowed. And he grew angry. Some translations try to tone that down to say, well, he was disturbed. No, he was furious. He was angry, and rightfully so. His was a righteous anger. Who is this man? For he must restore seven times what he took from that poor man. He is despicable, and which, of course, he has convicted himself. You are the man, Nathan confesses. And David, caught in his sin, is even more shocking in his reply. Because one, he doesn't defend himself. Two, he doesn't make excuses for himself. He is the king. He can come and go. He can take. He can give. He can do whatever he wants. And David chooses not to. No, what is shocking is he simply says, I have sinned against the Lord. He doesn't say, I've sinned against Bathsheba. He doesn't say, I've sinned against Uriah, though those are true. But just as God had asked the question, why do you despise me? Why do you despise my word? So David understands that his sin is first and foremost against God. When we miss the mark with God, we said last week, so we then miss the mark with everyone around us. If we get it right with God, then we will be right with our neighbors. That's why Jesus said, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. If we get it right with God, then we're in right with our neighbors. No, David confesses his sin. And he knows what the consequences of that should be. But Nathan assures him, no, you will not die. Medieval scribes within the Jewish synagogues, when they would make copies of this section of Samuel, and make additional scrolls 
of this section of Samuel. When they would write down 2 Samuel 12 and get to the 13th verse, they would leave a gap on the paper before it continued in verse 14. And the reason they left the gap there was so that the rabbi could insert the text from Psalm 51. Then if you look up Psalm 51, it is notated as David's psalm when confronted by Nathan. And in that psalm, the writer says in part, right after Nathan says, you will not die. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. The rabbis understood as the writer of Samuel understood. By his confession, David was restored. Beyond the heinousness of his crimes, he was restored with God and therefore restored with himself and hopefully restored with others. Just as Billy Chimmerer is restored at least with Mary Bartell, who forgave him and prayed for him every day of her remaining days of her life. It's a Bible. It's also a mirror for our lives. It's easy for us as individuals, it's easy for us as a church to cast judgment and to distance ourselves from those upon whom we have cast that judgment. It's a far more difficult and even shocking thing to extend grace to that person, to that group, to those others, to that organization that I am just so terribly upset with or even who I think has sinned against me. For us to extend grace and to extend forgiveness and to pray for them. This is what the followers of Jesus Christ do. This is what Jesus witnessed in his life. The prodigal son, the woman caught in adultery, Peter, after he denied even knew Jesus, restored at the lakeside. Time after time, Jesus exemplifies and calls his disciples to practice a grace and a forgiveness that is beyond their pain, a grace and a forgiveness that is beyond their hurt and even their righteous anger, and to instead allow the grace of God to be sufficient. That's what we have the opportunity to do, friends, in Holy Communion. We get down on our knees, wherever you are, we get down on our knees or the knees of our hearts, and we confess our sins. And God is faithful and just and forgives our sins and assures us, as Nathan assured David, you will not die, even on your insides, because of that sin, because you have confessed it, because I have forgiven it, because we are restored. This is the good news. These are the ties that bind. Amen. I would share with you that there's a lot going on in the church um, in anticipation of our August 15th new thing kickoff. We have people painting, we have people planting, we have people signing up and getting ready to greet you when you come in August 15th, maybe for the first time. We are readying this place by cleaning and making it a brand spanking new experience. That doesn't come free, that comes because of generous souls like you who contribute regularly to the life, the ministry, and the welcome of this church that all persons who come might feel restored. God bless. I again welcome all of you at home to participate in this Holy Communion. You can do that where you are. Gather some bread of most any kind 
some grape juice, and together we will share the body and the blood of Jesus Christ in this holy act of confession and forgiveness and restoration. Will you join me? The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, spoke to us through your prophets who looked for that day when justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. When nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, he fed the hungry, he ate with sinners like you and me. And by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and you made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit to at his ascension, you exalted him to sit and reign with you at your right hand. On the night in which he would give himself up for us, Jesus took bread and he blessed the bread and he broke it and he gave it to his friends. And he said, take and eat, all of you, for this is my body broken for you. Remember this every time that you eat of it. Likewise, after the meal, Jesus took the cup Again, he gave thanks to God. He blessed the cup and he gave it to his friends. He said, drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of a new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. And now with the confidence of the children who have confessed and forgiven, will you join with me as we pray like Jesus taught us? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen, amen. I invite you to receive the elements where you are at home. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. Your Yeah. 
thank you for being with us in the place of confession, forgiveness, and restoration. A couple of reminders. Next Sunday, we will have our second Sunday contemporary style service here at the 11 o'clock service live. And reminder, too, that our uh, church conference originally scheduled for today is now scheduled for August 22nd in order to give all our vacationers a chance to get back and be part of this important all-church discussion. Receive this benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of God, and the communion, and the fellowship, and the joy of the Holy Spirit be yours now and all this week for your sent in Christ's name and the whole church said, Amen.